Another heuristic that Kahneman and Tversky studied is one that students struggle with all the time. So do I. It's called the planning fallacy. And the planning fallacy says that we routinely underestimate how long it's going to take us to do something, how much it's going to cost, what the risks are. We underestimate those. Simultaneously, we overestimate um, the importance, the benefits of those actions. But let's focus on the first part. We consistently underestimate how long things are going to take. Let me give you a classic example. Sydney, Australia, one of their famous architectural landmarks is this, the Sydney Opera House. And in 1957, Sydney, Australia decided that they wanted to build their opera house and they estimated that it would be constructed by 1963 and it would cost $7 million. In reality, they, it took a decade longer and it cost $102 million. That's the planning fallacy. When we underestimate how much time and how much energy and equipment and resources we're going to need to do something. So students, here's a classic study that you really need to pay attention to. This was a study done with psychology majors and they were asked to estimate how long it would take them to write their senior thesis at a school where you couldn't graduate with your degree until you wrote an acceptable senior thesis. On average, students thought it would take them about 34 days to write their senior thesis. Then they were asked, okay, how long would it take you to write your senior thesis if everything went as well as possible? Um, you had no trouble accessing the resources that you wanted. Anybody you wanted to talk to was available when you wanted to talk to them. Um, everything just worked together. Your writing worked well. You didn't get sick. You didn't have any responsibilities at home. What's the fastest? 27 days on average. And then they said, okay, what if everything goes wrong? You get sick, you can't find the resources, your advisor, I don't know, moves to Canada, um, your dog bites your cat. I mean, everything just is a disaster. How long will it take you to write your senior thesis is everything is a disaster? And they said 48 days, okay? Then the experimenters just waited and counted how many days it took the students to write their senior thesis. And what was the average? 55 days longer than the amount of time they predicted if everything went as poorly as possible. Only 30% of the students were able to accurately predict how long it would take them to write their thesis. We do this all the time. So when we predict how long we think it's going to take us to do something, what we actually predict is how long we intend to work on it, when we intend to finish. So we count intentions more than reality. Now the funny thing is, and this is how you get around the planning fallacy guys, we are better able to predict when other people will finish a project than when we will finish the same project. So when you need to find out how long it's going to take you to study for an exam or write a paper, ask other people to make the prediction for you. Tell them what it's about and what you have to do and let them predict. They're going to be more accurate than you are. Why? Well, we focus on the future, we ignore past problems, and we, we don't know what other people's intentions are, so that doesn't trip us up. We only make the mistake when we're talking about ourselves. Here's the worst part of the planning fallacy. The more motivated you are to finish something, like a term paper at a particular time, the worse the planning fallacy becomes. That is, the bigger the difference between when you say you're gonna get it done and when you actually get it done. Ah. Related to the planning fallacy is overconfidence bias. We are insanely overconfident in ourselves. And this, I mean everybody. I'm gonna pick on President Trump here. When President Trump was asked on March 17th of this year what he was doing to combat the COVID pandemic, he said, we're getting rid of the virus, that's what we're doing. Well, as I'm recording this, um, the pandemic is much, much worse than it was in March. Before airplanes were developed and designed, the president of the British Royal Society said that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Right before the gigantic economic depression that hit the US in 1929, Harvard Economics Society said a severe depression like that that occurred in 1920, 1921 is outside of the range of possibility. We are way too confident. What does overconfidence mean? Well, um, when you are more certain in your judgments 
then you are accurate, right? So if I tell you that I'm 100% certain in something, but I'm actually only 50% accurate, that's overconfidence. And why do we experience overconfidence? Well, we think we're better than we are. It's called illusory superiority. Um, I think I can sing better than I really can. Trust me, I won't test that on you. It's also the case that people who are really bad at stuff have no idea how bad they are. I worked in an office once where one of the people I worked with was such a bad driver, I would literally wait if she was leaving not to go home because she was so bad and she had no idea. She got into three accidents in a month and didn't think it was her. That's illusory superiority. If, but it wasn't just her. If you ask the average American if they're a better than average driver, 93% of Americans think that they're better than average, right? If we were actually right, only 50% of Americans should think they're above average. The other 50% by definition are below average. And you guys will remember this graph from David Dunning's work um, back when we talked about studying for exams. Three quarters, so 75% of students in your typical class overestimate how well they know the material and overestimate the grade that they think they're going to get on the exam. Another example of overconfidence bias. We're also really overconfident in predicting what our friends will do. So in one study, you were asked to pick a friend and then just answer questions about the friend. Like, would you describe your friend's lecture notes as messy or neat? Um, if your friend found $5 on the ground, would they take the $5 or leave it there? Everybody was supposed to give their uh, answers and probabilities. So I'm 80% of the time, my friend takes neat notes. And how confident I, am I in that? Oh, I'm 100% confident. Okay, what did the results show? Confidence was about 76%. Accuracy was only 60%. People were more confident than they were accurate. Even when people were 100% confident in their decisions, they were only right 78% of the time. But if that's a grade, it's like a C, right? 100% confident, but the accuracy, 78%. That's overconfidence. We're also overconfident in predicting what we will do. So for example, um, different study, experimenters ask you, you know, will you visit San Francisco more than three times this year? This was done in Northern California. Will you participate in a play that your dorm puts on? Will you drop a course? And they ask people to give probabilities that each of these things would happen to them that year. And what happened? Again, this big gap, 82% confident, but only 68% accurate. The gap's even bigger than when you're dealing with friends. And again, when people were 100% confident that they would do something, they were only 77% accurate. So we are way too confident. That also leads to something nasty called blaming the victim. So a lot of blaming the victim is when we attribute someone else's behaviors as a reason that they were victimized in this way. So for example, somebody might tell you, I was mugged when I was walking home from work. And your first reaction might be, oh, it's too unsafe to walk home from work. That's blaming the victim. Um, we do it because it's a defense mechanism, the good old fashioned Freudian defense mechanism. It makes us feel less vulnerable. It's a way that we can distance ourselves from the bad things that happen to people. Um, and it tends to give rise to this belief in a just world hypothesis, which is even, has even more uh, negative repercussions because it, it, it breaks down the bonds of empathy. You know, when you see a homeless person, you say, well, you know, they must have done something to have created that situation rather than to open our own checkbooks and think, oh man, any one of us is, you know, one or two check, uh, one or two paychecks away from being homeless. That's it.